a warm word of welcome from our side on behalf of SAPEX and Soldati. It's a privilege to share with you today the stepping stones to successful self-leadership that I've been toying with um, over the last pretty much 35 years of my life. It's uh, more critical than ever, I think, uh, in, in the times that we're living in, that we are, are good leaders. And, and I've got no doubt that leadership starts with self. And I would like to share with you today what I've experienced over, over my lifetime, the tools and techniques and the things, the methods, if you want to call it, that works from a self-leadership point of view. I've, I'm convinced that only by leading ourselves successfully can we become the best that we can possibly be and also be the best leaders to others that, that, that we can possibly be. And uh, I'm going to get straight into it and share my screen with you and uh, let's kick off uh, with the presentation. So just very briefly, uh, who am I? Family man like most people should be. I've got two boys, Chris and Henry. I'm married, uh, married to Marley. I am an African born and bred. I love the African bush. I'm a swimmer, although I can't do too much uh, 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 open water swimming these days in the days we're living in. I'm a motorcyclist. That is my bike, by the way, but it's not me on that bike. I am a supply chain, certified supply chain professional through the, the, through, uh, the ACM. I'm also an MBA graduate from uh, Wits Business School, and I last year completed a PhD in personal and professional leadership through UJ. From a career point of view, I've been... Uh, my whole working career till, till the beginning of last year, I was in the corporate world. I had the privilege of uh, having uh, exec positions across the supply chain. And then last year, I made a call that I want to follow my passion and also what I've studied in terms of my PhD research. And that's to head up an organization called Soldati, Southern African Leadership Development and Training Institute, where I where we focus on growing leaders and impacting results, not only in their own lives, but also from an organizational point of view. So pretty much just, just off the bat, I want to tell you that, I referred to it earlier, but my self-leadership journey started in 1986 when I bought this book, who hopefully you've, uh, many of you have read, uh, The Powers, Power of Positive Thinking. And since then, I've been toying with what works and makes us bet better leaders. And that's why we're here today to share that with you. So just some things to note. Um, I'm covering some of the material, and if I refer to some of the material, what I mean is that um, there's much more to this topic, which we'll get to later on as well, in terms of a book that I'm, I've written on it and I've, that I'm busy publishing. I'm doing the presentation liberally using quotes uh, for good reason. First of all, I think we can all learn from wise people out there that's experienced all the things that we are experiencing. But also, secondly, it gives us some comfort that we're not the only people that's dealing with, this, with these things. Even famous people deal with the stuff that we're dealing in terms of becoming better leaders and leading ourselves better. So literally today, I hope and I trust that it will be a selfless re reflection session for you uh, that will cover an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes. Forgive me if I slightly overstep on time today. And that you can reflect on your self-leadership journey in an attempt to, to, to improve in terms of uh, le leading yourself. So I want to ask you to please take your sound to 100%. I'm going to show a couple of videos, and I would hate you to, to miss the sound clips that's related to that. And then pretty much I'll try my best to finish my presentation in 55 minutes, and then we'll allow for Q&A at the end, if that's okay. Right, so just very briefly, what is self-leadership? So self-leadership is the practice of intentionally influencing our thinking, our feeling, and our behavior to achieve objectives and key to this is to achieve our objectives because ultimately that's what we want to do in life it is the basis of self-leadership but to me it's so much more it's about laying the foundation to better lead others it's about filling up achieving our full potential as as leaders and as self-leaders and it's also a question in my mind of living a legacy that makes us proud ultimately and i'll get into a little bit of that later on as well Day, it will be awful. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. So 
So Brian Wigley said, one life to live, live it well. And the essence of, to me, of self-leadership is I can only live well and make use of this one life that I've got to, the, to my best ability if I am leading myself properly. So I'm going to cover a number of items, 20 to be exact, just short aspects that I've identified is important around self-leadership. And the first one is taking charge of your life. It's your life, nobody else's. And the quote I've got there says, until you take charge of your life, uh, nothing will happen. The last two lines of the Invictus poem of William Ernest Henley reads, I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. And I think that pretty much sums it up in terms of leading ourselves and taking charge of our own lives. We all know Oprah Winfrey very well and, and all her successes. But very few of us, I think, know that as a child she wore potato uh, sacks for clothing, that she was raped for the first time at the age of nine by a family member, that she was pregnant at the age of 14, and 14 days after giving birth to her baby, a, a child died. And I think in all of that, Oprah had to also think, hang on, doesn't matter what my circumstances are, I need to take charge. And then she secured a job in radio while she was still at school. And the rest, as I say, is history. Because I would think in all of that, Oprah at some point drew the line and said, I'm going to ch take charge of my life, and whatever it takes, I'm going to take control. Right, so the point is we need to live with intent. If we don't live with intent, we're like a, a, a cork, a wine cork floating on the surface of the water and just being shoved around from pillar to post. I had an executive coach for three years um, previously in my career, and in Jenny's office, there was a quote that said, this is your world, shape it, or somebody else will. And I think that's critical in terms of taking charge of your life. The bottom line is that we need to live the life that you and I have been blessed with. We can't try and live somebody else's life. So Steve Jobs said, your time is limited, don't waste it living somebody else's life. Because you are not somebody else, you are you. Bill Gates said, I'm not in competition with anyone but myself. My goal is to improve myself continuously. And in that, I want to tell you that the only person you should be comparing yourself to in terms of taking charge of your life is yourself and what the best possible version of, of yourself is. So the question is, is your locus of control internal or external? If our locus of control is internal, like it should be as successful self-leaders, then we don't bl blame others or circumstances for what's happening to us. We don't blame the victim, uh, or play the victim game rather. So a man can fail, or a woman can fail many times, but if he or she isn't a failure, or, but, but he or she isn't a failure until he or she begins to blame somebody else. So the bottom line is, again, is that you and I are in charge 99% of the time. We go and sit down and we really think about it. I want to talk to you about planning for success, because success without planning is luck. So you might ask, but why am I asking the question, what is your definition of, of success? The issue is, if we don't, in our own minds, define what our definition of success is, then we wouldn't know where to align our lives to and, and, and what to aim to in our lives. So Anne Sweeney said, define success on your terms, achieve it by your own rules, and build a life you're proud of. If you ask me, what's Aki's definition of success? I think the only measure of success is when you, as an individual, look one day back on your life with fondness and you can say, I've achieved what I wanted to achieve and what I see looks good. Plan to have options in life. Chris Rock said, wealth is not a, about having a lot of money, it's about having a lot of options. So where I grew up in a farming area, there were a lot of tomato farms. And the ladies that were laborers in those farms plucking tomatoes for the farmers, it wasn't uncommon for them to give labor to a child while they were busy working and to be back at, at work the next day. And there, were very, there are very unfortunate reasons why that is the case. But one of the reasons is that they didn't have any options in life. And they didn't have a choice than to be back to provide for their family and earn a living. So the reality is that if you don't have options in life, Somebody, hold, somebody can hold your ransom. And that's not what we want as self-leaders. We want to have options. The issue, though, is that it takes time. 
And we as self-leaders need to realize, in order to have options in life, we need to start right here, right now. Scripting your self-leadership charter. And that, that term, self-leadership charter, is a hacky term. I don't think you'll find it anywhere, anywhere else, but I think it's a nice description of what, how we can document our dreams and convert it into goals. So Lubus Kallias said, we should be determined to live, to live for something. We can't be that proverbial cork on the water floating and, and just li live life without uh, having dreams and, and converting those dreams into, into goals. So, Henry and Chris are my two sons. Like I said, Henry is in first year matric, uh, first year at Varsity rather this year. Last year he was in matric. And I went to, to fetch him from camp uh, in Joburg and I said, my boy, do you want to meet you, come and fetch you and have lunch with you? at our favorite restaurant, and then take you to boarding school in Pretoria. And actually, it was easier for him, dri driving with dad back to, to school, uh, or take the bus, and uh, having proper lunch versus uh, having boarding school uh, lunch. And he said, Dad, please come and fetch me. So we had lunch, and we had fun, and we had good quality time together. And then in that conversation, he asked me, he said, Dad, you're finishing your PhD now, and you took a sabbatical, but what are you going to do for the rest of your life? And it's an interesting question. Now, fortunately, I was chewing, so I could think about the question. And I said, my boy, I'm going to start still Darty because that's what I want to do for a living. I want to assist organizations to run their leadership development programs and, and, and custom design those for them and facilitate those for them. So I said, Dad, uh, so I asked him, why are, you, why are you asking? He said, Dad, it's simple. He said, because in life, you need to take into account three things. He says, first of all, whatever you do, you need to make an impact on people and on this world. And then he said, secondly, you need to love what you do. And then finally, and in this order, make enough money to provide for yourself and to provide for us. And he says, your life should be detailed in that order. And to me, that was quite profound. And I thought, this guy, he's a, he's a late baby. He just turned 17. And I thought, wow, this really sets the scene almost in my life, thinking, in, how do I handle and manage and lead the next chapter of my life. At that point, I almost swallowed my fork together with my spaghetti carbonara. But I think it's a nice guide for all of us when we decide how we're going to translate our dreams into our goals and actually try and achieve those goals. So Mark Twain said, the most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. And just, I want to put a disclaimer out there, please. I'm not saying for one second that you need to resign from what you're doing now and start to, to do something else, that's not the case. The whole idea is that you develop as a self-leader and that you can optimize where you are. Obviously, if you're unhappy and you, you hate what you're doing, that's a different story. But the bottom line is, that, again, that we take ourselves where we go. So if you don't, you're not successful at self-leadership, you're going to not be successful in another setting. Uh, so sort yourself out and lead yourself properly in, 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 the, in the environment where you're currently finding yourself. So I want to ask yourself or you guys to do an, an exercise for me after this presentation. And I call it the newspaper exercise. I want you to forward, fast forward your life to an hour before you die. And you might say, okay, but this is a depressing thought. But it's not because I think it's a, it's a liberating thought. Because in that, you can say, if I have to script the cover page of my newspaper and call, if your name is Jane, call it the Jane Times as opposed to the Sunday Times. And script what would you like to see one day be the highlights of your front page of your newspaper, of your life. And then work your way back and say, okay, this is what I want. And how do I translate those dreams into goals now and start actively working on those to make it a reality? So tra translating your dreams into goals starts with you need, need to give yourself permission to dream. It's fine to dream. It's great to dream. But those dreams are, that are persistent are the dreams that you need to chase. If your dreams do not scare you, they're not big enough. And Zig Ziglar said, if you aim at nothing, you'll eat it every time. So I want to encourage you to apply stretch to your life and translating your dreams into goals. Of all the quotes that I've ever read, this is my favorite from uh, Michelangelo. He says, the greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and, fa and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. So the point is, why, why would you want to live half a life 
and only, only achieve half your potential if you can stretch and, and achieve your full potential. So it's important that we visualize our, our dreams. And visualizing your dreams have its own power to complete your dreams. So visualize it to accomplish it. And you start by, by actually looking at all the areas of your life. Not one area, not career only, not family only. But put on a piece of paper what's your balanced will. And I'm sharing with you a little bit of my inner self and showing you what does is, what is my real balanced will look like. And in the top left corner, you'll see it's around self-development. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later, just showing you as an example of how do I translate that dream or that main goal of self-development into becoming a reality. So my self-leadership chart is, consists of two things. First of all, my own credo, which I call it because I just think it's more impactful if you look at the definition of credo as well. Some people call it a personal mission statement. And that can be in bullet form or it can be in paragraph form. But it's important that you script what do you see your identity, identity as a person as being. Muhammad Ali said, true success is reaching our potential without compromising our values. And pretty much your own credo is a summary of what are your values and what do you align your life to and, and what do you live every single day. I read a book called Finishing Strong when I, was, uh, when I tested positively for COVID law, end of last year um, by Steve Ferrer. And he says, you would only have one four-letter personal mission statement, and that is, do not screw up. And he says, if there's an inscription on his tombstone one day to say, Steve never screwed up in any areas of his life, getting back to the balanced wheel, then he would be satisfied. But I want to focus more on the personal goal scorecard, which, which I derived from the balanced scorecards which company uses, companies use. So Peter Drucker, the father of management, said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And that's critical in our lives as, as self-leaders as well and, and trying to achieve self-leadership success. So again, I'm, leading, I'm, 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 I'm inviting you into my world. I just want to quickly share this with you. You'll see on the left-hand side, this one aspect of my personal goal scorecard around self-development, which is the area on the left. I've translated into, into a goal, and this main personal goal description is learning to be fluent in speaking Zulu. And to the right of that is an affirmation for this main personal goal. And we don't have time to get into it, but an affirmation is simply a statement of, of the future that I'm making in the present. I'm basically saying now what I'm going to achieve in the future, but in, in, in the present tense. Let me show you this example. And note what I've highlighted, because that's important as well. I'm already fluent in Zulu by 1 April 2022, in such a manner that I'm always starting and following a conversation with someone without feeling uncomfortable, because this allows me to build bridges with so many other people in our country up to the end of my life, and is a testimony of the fact that I believe in diversity and inclusion. And to the right of that, in my personal goal score, scorecard, I have what are the personal, or what are the supporting goals, rather, that will allow me to achieve my main, main uh, personal goal. I've got a planned achievement date. I've got an overall main goal progress percentage. And then I've got, on the right-hand side, very importantly, what would I do and how would I celebrate, in this case, definitely with my family, because Marley, my wife, and I are doing this together, how would I celebrate with them that we've actually achieved our main personal goal in becoming fluent in Zulu. So I just said there, I would love to visit the Zulu cultural village in Ishowe for a weekend with my family, family as, as, as a way of, of, of celebrating. So the next slide talks to the supporting goals, like I said. And I'm not going to take you through all of them. just want to touch on the first one. First one says, successfully complete and pass the Isuzulu elementary course at Witch Language School. Now, we started that last Saturday. So I can mark that progress as 10%. And this supports my own personal goal um, that we, we touched on in the previous slide. So it is daunting, it is difficult, but we committed, and that's important, and we're going to make this happen. And now I've shared it with the whole world, with all you guys, so now I have no other choice than to become fluent in Zulu. Maybe not by April next year, but certainly sometime in the future. So what if we fall behind in terms of our goals that we want to achieve? And, 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 and achieving those, those main personal goals. That's fine. 
If your plan isn't working, change the plan, not the goal. It's important that before you put pen to paper and you, you actually write down your main personal goals in those different areas on the balance wheel, that you make sure that is really what you want to achieve in life. And assuming that that's the case, then don't change the goal. Change the plan, like this quote tells us. Change the supporting goals to enable you then to actually achieve that main personal goal. Avoiding time wasters and distractors. We need to concentrate on our goals. Do not allow other thoughts to enter our mind or your mind. And that's important. When I started working at NAMPAC in 1997, after a couple of months, my boss called me into the office. He said, Aki, you know what? I, we need to discuss something. Sit down. And I said, yes, Nas, what is it? He said, you know you're like a bushman. And originally I thought, jeez, you must be referring to the fact that I'm alert, I'm wake up, I'm dedicated. And then he said, let me explain. And I said, please, please do. I'm listening. He said, you're like a bushman that finishes his breakfast and goes out to hunt to find meat for the tribe to enjoy that evening. He says, and then as you leave the camp, you see Impala spur, and then you start to track this Impala. But just before you get to the Impala, you actually see Royal Bear spur, and then you change direction, and you go and you follow the Royal Bear spur. And the same happens with the Blue Villa Bears, and eventually you see a, 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 a Eland, uh, or, or at least it's spur, and you decide, but hang on, it's 3, 4, four o'clock in the afternoon, but I can make this kill, and this will make me a euro when I get back to, back to camp. And just as, I, as the spur is getting fresh of the Eland, dusk set, sets in, and the sun sets, and I have to get back to my tribe empty-handed and embarrassed. He said, Aki, you're being distracted too much, and by that you're wasting time, and that will make it you don't achieve your goal. And the same applies to us in terms of our self-leadership journey. So the point is, the time is running up. There was a song from Queen that we all know, uh, should know, and it's called uh, The Great Pretender. It was actually banned in, in the 50s, in 1955, that, that, that made this song famous the first time, uh, and, and they were, they were uh, called the platters. So the point is that we all are pretenders. We pretend we're never going to die. And I'm not trying to get you depressed, but the point is, if we don't realize that we're going to die, we might say, I'll postpone translating my dreams into goals. I'll do it next year of the week or the next year, after next year or in five years' time even. The point is, guys, <laughs> there might not be five years. And then, looking back to the newspaper exercise, the li your life didn't end like you wanted it to. You didn't achieve the goals that you wanted it to. And only by focusing on the areas that will make us successful as self-leaders, I believe we'll be able to, 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 to realize those goals and make them a reality. The point is that the sand is running through the hourglass and the time to start getting our self-leadership journey on track is today, right now. And we need to find ways to manufacture time. You might say to me, Aki, it's, it's impossible. I'm telling you it's possible. Because by manufacturing time, you allow for more time to focus on your goals and achieving those goals quicker and earlier in your life. So one of those areas is that, that you can manage your, your precious time better. And if we focus and we apply laser focus on achieving our objectives and our goals, that is one way of, of managing our time better. I love this quote. It says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Focus on the stuff in your life that needs attention. Don't waste your time and get distracted by focusing on stuff that is actually okay. And what I love about this quote, if you read it in red, it also says, if it ain't okay, fix it. So, delegate. I had a conversation with somebody this morning about these inability to delegate. The point is, only do what only you can do. I wouldn't suggest that you try this at home, because if you tell this to your spouse, you or she might say, but hang on, stuff you, and it, it might be a very unpleasant uh, weekend if you, if you make that statement on a Friday. But the point is, at work, you need to delegate and trust other people. Focus on the stuff that only you can do. And the best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to trust them, actually, is what Hemingway said. You need to let go. You need to release. Deal with issues quickly and decisively. Because procrastination makes easy things hard and hard things harder. My executive coach that I referred to earlier, Jenny, I at some point told her, I can't handle the amount of emails I'm getting. I'm getting 60, 70, 80 emails a, a day. What do I do with this stuff? So she said, okay, I'm going 
I want to put a challenge to you, and I'm doing it to you guys on the other side of the virtual screen today. If you get emails, do one or, two, one or, one of, or three things. First one is forward it to someone else, like one of your peers, because it's actually their responsibility. Delegate it to someone else, and or book a meeting to address the issue. And by doing this, you will free up time to more focus. Focus on your goals, professionally at work, but also in your private life. Don't fall behind of your responsibilities. TV licenses, renewing your driver's license, submitting your e-filing to SARS if, you, uh, if you're in South Africa, renewing your post box, and we can carry on. The point is, if you fall behind on those things, then you need to get somebody else to sort it out, you need to pay extra money, you're in trouble, it occupies your time, you waste your time. Guys, what I do is, in my diary, which I hope you have, in the one diary, and that's also important that you only have one diary that you live your life by, I put in the due date for these things a month in advance. So even if I overstep by two weeks, guess what? I'm still ahead of time, and I'm still in time, and I don't need to worry about the consequences of falling behind as far as my responsibilities are concerned. I want to talk to you about living a disciplined life. I love this quote. We must all suffer one of two things, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. You need to pick. Discipline is the bridge between goals and accomplishment. Gary Player, in my mind, is Mr. Discipline. He won 167 professional golf tournaments. He's the only person to have completed both the Grand Slams on the Senior Tour and the, and the uh, PGA Tour. He raised more than $62 million for children's education, and he's, amongst other accolades, he's a Laureus Lifetime Achievement Award he received. So at 85, he's still believing in a disciplined fitness and healthy living regime. So if there was a, an award that was called the Global Discipline Ambassador Award, I've got no doubt that Gary would have earned that award, and he would have achieved it or received it. But I can promise you, that if Gary Player didn't live the disciplined life that he did, he might not have achieved all of the accomplishments that he actually had. And there's a lesson in that for us, each one of us. Whole and complete is a phrase that I picked up on when I had a conversation once with Dawi Furi, who heads up Ali in, in Namibia. It's an acronym for African Leadership Institute. Great guy, a great saying. We need to try and achieve or, or, or try and strive towards becoming whole and complete as self-leaders. Charles Dickens said, the important thing is this, to be ready at any moment to sacrifice what you are for what you could become. And I believe firmly that a key, a, a, a big part of that and achieving that is discipline. So do what is right versus what is easy. Professor Dumbledore, in one of the Harry Potter movies, say this, we must all make the choice between what is right and what is easy. And to me, that strikes to the heart of having discipline. Our challenge as self-leaders. I want to talk to you about this fallacy of intermittent discipline. Because sometimes we think, when I'm with my family or with my folks, I can live a life of discipline. But when I go out with my friends or go away on a golfing weekend with them, I can Switch off discipline. The reality is that discipline isn't a switch. You can't switch it on one moment of your life and switch it off the other moment. You can, but you have to suffer the consequence of living a suboptimal life and only achieving half of what you, what you possible, possibly can achieve. So it's important that we always follow a disciplined life. So why even bother with discipline? And I think Stephen Covey summarized it very, very nicely when he said, only the disciplined are truly free. The undisciplined are slaves to moods, appetites, and distractions. And I can tell you, especially the last five years of my life, when I've applied much more discipline than I've ever had before, that what he's saying is absolutely spot on. But I talked about refusing to make excuses. Sharma says, victims make excuses, leaders deliver results. I want to introduce you to a chap called John Morrow. So John is the most successful blogger in the world. He became wealthy only through blogging. But he, here's, here's the catch. He was born with spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. According to doctors, he should have died by now. And the, the reality is he, is he can only move his face. And he writes by his blogs by controlling a keyboard simulator with his mouth and with speech recognition technology. 
Amazing. John Morrow doesn't believe in excuses. He doesn't accept an excuse. The question to you and me is, what's our excuse? Because an excuse, an excuse is, a sto- is a story that you tell yourself to sell yourself. And excuses limit our experience and our horizons. This is what I read in a book from Sam Silver Silverstein called No More Excuses. Our personal goals don't care about our excuses. That's reality. If you really want to do it, then do it. There's no excuses. Florence Nightingale said, I attribute, I attribute my success to this. I na- never gave or took an excuse. I want to chat to you guys about getting through tough times. I have to believe that when things are bad, I can change them. So this guy's name is Brett Archibald. Some of you might have read his book. He's an international businessman, entrepreneur, and a surfer. And he fell overboard in the Mantua Strait off the coast of Indonesia. He should have died after 10 years being in the water of exhaustion and, and dehydration, but he didn't. He made it. After enduring also a shark uh, encounter and, and being attacked by seagulls, he survived for 28 hours in the Indian Ocean. So he understands how important it is to push through and to dig deep. So Billy, Billy Ocean recorded a song, When the Go Gets Tough, the Tough Gets Going, 1985. Bill Gates says, life's not fair, get used to it. Might not be always as simple as that, but that's the reality. We cannot change the cards that we've been dealt with, but just how we play the hand. There's a couple of silver linings, though, in terms of tough times. The first one is that everybody experiences tough times. And the only people that don't experience it are in the cemetery. There's also the reality that there's no education like adversity. Whenever I experience tough times, and you guys will attest to this as well, then I come out through it to the other side, and I've learned through that experience. The reality is we are never alone, and we need to make that, that, is, that is some comfort and we need to make use of the people around us to assist us in those tough times. So our challenge as successful self-leaders is that we need to muddle through. We need to push through like Winston Churchill says. If you're going through hell, keep on going. And we need to try and change our mindset to say that, hang on, let me think of adversity as opportunity rather than adversity that I can't overcome. When I went through a tough divorce, I had three choices at that point in my life. I could choose to give up on life, frankly. I know it's an extreme, but sometimes those things cross your mind when you really go through tough times. I could have chosen to stay the same, or I could have chosen chosen a new chapter in my life to say, hang on, I'm going to excel from now on. I'm going to operate on a different level. And that's the challenge, as far as I'm concerned, for us as self-leaders. We need to grab those lemons, and we need to convert them into lemonade. And please, in tough times, don't be hard on yourself. We need to realize that we need to care for ourselves, and especially in tough times, we need to be soft on ourselves. Becoming more resilient. So life doesn't get easier or more forgiving. We get stronger and more resilient, and I think we can attest to that after what we've been through the last 18 months. So this guy's name is um, Alex Zanotti. He's an Italian F- Formula One and car driver, but on 15 September 2001, he had a terrible crash, uh, and he lost both his legs on impact. His heart stopped seven times on his way to the hospital. He only had one liter of blood left, and I think uh, we more or less have six liters of, of, of blood in our, on our bodies as, as grown-ups. He only had one liter left. But then he decided, but hang on, I'm not going to die in a wheelchair. And he went back after a couple of years, and he joined the World Touring, uh, World Touring Car Championships, and he recorded five wins and, and, and five podiums. And after he thought, hang on, I'm not sharp enough to be a racing car driver anymore, he went and he, did, he, he moved to hand cycling. And across two Olympics, he achieved three gold medals and two silver uh, medals, which is incredible. So he's a, a true ambassador of, 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 of saying, you can't give up. The Japanese proverb says, fall down seven times, stand up eight. When I was a boy, that was pretty much me. I was 10 years old and I was diagnosed with something called Korea. I had involuntary muscle movements in my face and in my, my, my limbs. Made fun of as a child, originally di- misdiagnosed, and, and I sat in front of a specialist with my mom, who was a nurse, 
at the time, and he said, uh, your son has got a, got a tick, he will never recover, and he will never uh, come right again. And fortunately, that was a misdiagnosis, and I, and I, and I went through it, and I, it taught me in life that we can't refuse to give up, even at, at, at a young age like that. So how do I deal with stress? And I will give you guys tips maybe to deal with stress. Is first of all, to do your rolling fortnightly planning in your life. You can't just all of a sudden wake up to the fact you've got a, that you've got a big presentation tomorrow like I'm doing to you guys today. I, every Sunday evening or Monday morning, I look at my next two weeks. And then I keep, in, keep on looking at my next two weeks. That takes the stress off because in the back of my mind, I'm starting to subconsciously prepare already for what's coming. And I know always there's no stress because I'm prepared and it's fine. I try to apply a concept called zone of proximity. And uh, Muhammad Ali was... He was the master at this. And what that simply means is, I don't stress, and I try my best not to stress before a big event like this. Because guess what? Maybe it gets cancelled. I don't know. And then I stress, stress for nothing. Leading up to, the, to his fights, Muhammad Ali certainly came across as being calm and collected. Even when he stepped into the ring to, to do the fight, in his corner, sitting on his, on his uh, corner or ring, ringside chair or stool, he was calm, collected, he waved at the people that had ringside seats. But when he got into arm's way and the bell rang and he got into reach of his opponent, a Joe Fraser, for example, then he would be ready and he would be in the zone of proximity. Then he would stress. Yes, it doesn't take away the fact that we should plan, but guys, how many times have, has it happened in your life that you've stressed about stuff and it actually never happens? An event gets cancelled. And then you stress for nothing. So it's important that we try and master that in our journey of becoming successful self-leaders. And then charging your life batteries. I referred to it earlier. I'm a biker. I'm a swimmer. And if I don't do those, do those things frequently, then I don't charge my, my life batteries. And my glass runs empty. And when I'm empty, I can't operate at the level that I should. And I certainly can't find enough time and energy to try and chase my dreams and my goals. So it's important also to, that you ask yourself, how do you, how do you handle feedback? We all need people who will, so, will give us feedback because that's how we improve. And sometimes we need to have crocodile skin. Sometimes we shouldn't take things personally. And we also need to evaluate from, from who does the common who's actually giving it to us. Who's the guy that's giving it to us? Is it somebody that's evil, that wants to harm us, that's not sincere? Or is it the good guy that actually wants to give me constructive feedback that I, I must think about and say, okay, hang on. Where it comes from, it's valid. I need to consider it and I need to change the way I'm showing up. Importance of work-life balance. I referred to this earlier. And it's critical that we have that balance as opposed to being a workaholic, for example. If you only focus on one area, like your work, and you get fired, guess what? You've got nothing left. There's nothing that can, that, that can pull you through, that can make you more resilient to get through a tough time like that, for example, if that makes sense to you. Being charged with your emotions. When you react, you let others control you. When you respond, you are actually in control. There's a lovely story that Richard Stengel, who was, who was the author of Mandela's Way, wrote, as he was waiting, uh, he was waiting for, for uh, President Mandela or Madiba at the old uh, Durban International Airport. And where on his way there, Madiba had only had two pilots in front. He had, he had his bodyguard, Mike. And at some point, while uh, Madiba was writing, uh, reading his newspaper, he called Mike and he, he said, look outside, the one propeller stopped. And he said, please go and tell the pilots. Obviously, they knew at that point. But Mike went to tell them. And when they landed, all the emergency guys were there on the tarmac. But they landed safely. And as Madiba got into the, got into the airport building, he was bombarded by Japanese tourists that wanted to take pictures, etc. And then Mike went to chat to Richard the author of the book who joined uh, Madiba to go to this politi uh, political rally. And Mike told Richard what happened. And Mike said, Richard, I couldn't believe it. Madiba was so calm and collected. He was like a commuter on a train going to work in the morning. And then later on, Richard and, and Madiba got into the car with another driver. And on, on their way to the rally, Richard asked him about this. And uh, Richard said, what happened? And Madiba turned to him and he, with wide eyes and he said, I was terrified. So that's the point. We are self-leaders. We need to be in charge of our emotions. And we need to rather have EQ than IQ. 
I'm going to skip one or two of the quotes, which you guys will be able to read afterwards uh, when you get the, the recording and also the slides. But I read this somewhere in a, tri in a trade show that I've attended. And it says, people are hired for their talents, but fire for their behavior. And that's so true. One of the HR execs that I managed, had the privilege of working with, and I'm honoring her in this quote, Debbie Sinclair, she said, at the point where someone's nuisance value starts to exceed the value that he or she adds, that person should exit the organization. And may we as successful self-leaders, on our way to, to successful self-leadership, not be guilty of that. Don't take the bait. I set myself the personal boundary a long time ago where I said, especially in a public forum, I won't get upset and I won't allow people to, to, to upset me. Lincoln said, better to remain silent and be thought of a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. Don't you think we should tell them that the boat's out of gas? Nah, just smile and wave, boys. Yeah. Smile and wave. So rather sm smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave if you have to, as opposed to getting upset and showing how badly. Living in the present moment and finding what's good about it is how I want to live. There was a movie called Click. You guys might recall this, where Adam Sandler plays the role, played the role of Michael Newman, where he managed to fast forward bad times in his life. And the question I've got for you is, are you a pilgrim or a tourist in life? And it's something I had to grapple with after listening to a sermon with this topic. Because we can't afford to be tourists. We have to be pilgrims. As motorcyclists, we've got this saying, at gat, all the gear, all the time. And it's important that we, all, that we always gear up and gear, gear down when we ride motorcycles. On the left-hand side, you might not be able to see it that clearly, but there's a guy that's battered and bruised. On the right-hand side, it's somebody who's got the right gear. And that's obviously what we, we'd like to aim for. And I always said, hang on, I just want to turn the throttle. I don't want to go through the schlep of ge gearing up and gearing down. The reality is, and at some point I realized that that's part of the experience. If I'm a tourist, I don't want to do all that stuff. But if I'm a pilgrim, which I should be as a self-leader, I experience and want to experience every part of life and appreciate that. Don't let your future be the thief of your present. Improving self-confidence. Need, we need to have faith in our abilities. With self-confidence, we can succeed. So the power of self-talk is important. So Jordan Belfort, the wolf of, of, um, of Wall Street, said, the only thing standing between you and your goals is the bullshit story you keep telling yourself as to why you can't achieve it. And I think it's so true. Because positive self-talk is the key to any successful person. If you can change the voice in your mind, you can do anything. We need to believe that we are good enough. I always say rule number one, do not sell yourself short. Your self-worth is more important than your net worth. And the most important day in your life is when you decide you are good enough. It's the day you set yourself free. We need to choose to be positive as successful self-leaders. Because an optimist rises to the occasion when the going gets tough. Guys, name is Henry Flesher. He was arrested in 1942 as an 18-year-old Jewish man. He still has, has it, we still had it at two, to two, number 298 of 300 um, on his arm that were chosen to work or to be part of a working team at Auschwitz, the, the Nazi camp, concentration camp. And everybody over 300 were executed. For three years, he moved between different Nazi camps. And amongst other things, he had a broken jaw and he was lashed like a dog. He called it hell. But despite experiencing all of that for three years, his life outlook on life was, life is beautiful. No need to complain or hate. Optimism is a choice. Once Molly and I had breakfast together, and I made a comment that wasn't supporting optimism. In fact, it was negative. And she turned around to me and she said, you know what, it's a choice. And frankly, it is as simple as that. We, optimism doesn't wait on facts. It deals with prospects. Pessimism is a waste of time. Let's not waste our time and be pessimistic ever. Privilege. If we ever want to become pessimistic, we need, we need to realize how, how privileged we are. And we, need to, we need to count our blessings. In Africa, 40% of the people live on less than $1.90 per day. Less than 26 rand. 55 million people or more are living on. 
fortunately we're not in that on that that side of, of, of the fence, but it also gives us more reason than ever to count our blessings and be optimistic. The power of my thought, speech and attitude is critical. Bruce Lee said, what you habitually think largely determines what you will ultimately become. Sharma said, words can inspire and words can destroy. Choose yours well. Your attitude will determine your altitude. Is a quote that I had next to my phone in my office for everybody to see for a very long time in the corporate world. Very important. We need to be stepping out of our comfort zone because life begins at the end of, of our comfort zones. Patrice Mutsepe was a successful lawyer. In 1993, he was promoted to partner at one of the biggest law firms in the country. But yet at that point, at the dawn of a new era in our country where he must have been set up to be a guy that could have, been, could have had such a great legacy on, 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 the, on the law side of things, he decided, no, he's going to leave uh, Bowman Gilfillan and he's going to become the founder of Future Mining. And later on in 1997, he launched, launched African Rainbow Minerals. And the rest is history, as they say. He was the first black African to be on the Forbes billionaires list. And in 2013, he donated half his wealth to charity. He understood that the magic happens outside of our comfort zones. If we're growing, we're always going to be out of our comfort zones. And that's the reality. We, don't be, we shouldn't be scared to do that and to venture down that road. So what's the criteria for getting out of your comfort zone if you're not there yet? First of all, you need to trust and believe in yourself or if you're a religious person or, and also if you're a religious person in, in, in your God. You need to be courageous. You can't be scared. You need to find ways of overcoming that, that, that fear. Bill Cox said, Life will only change when you become more committed to your dreams than you are to your comfort zones. And to me, the acid test around getting out of my comfort zone, and especially in our continent, is do I embrace diversity and inclusion? Africa's one continent, one people, and one nation. And I've experienced it with Marley when, for the second time in 2018, we went to the F&B Stadium with the local derby between Kaiser Chiefs and um, Orlando Pirates. And I've had the privilege of have of, of, of many stadium experiences, including what, uh, what uh, being at uh, Arsenal City uh, with the Emirates Cup in 2017. And I can tell you that if the F&B stadium, uh, stadium experience Marley and I had was the best ever. And it's important that we as Africans with all our diversity realize that we need to cross that boundary. We need to cross the fence and embrace diversity and inclusion. And now we're doing a Zulu course and I'm committed to you and to myself to complete it and to get to a point where I can fluently speak Zulu. Learn and live good habits. Your health, wealth, happiness, fitness and success depends on your habits. So the first step I think under this topic is to release bad habits. You must say the last time was the, was the last time. You can't be in like an alcoholic that, that would say after the next bottle or two then I will stop. Ah, the last time was the last time when you want to try and release a bad habit. Also replace that bad habit with a good one. When I stopped smoking, yes, I did smoke at some point. In the army in 1992, I replaced it, the bad habit of smoking with eating junk food. I gained a lot of K's in a very short space of time as opposed to replacing it with a good habit. And do it one habit at a time. We're only human. One habit at a time. Mandela said it always seems impossible until it's done. Yes, but, and pause and engage. You get a lot of people that you can see as you try and convey something to them, they want to tell you, they want to chip in and they want to say, yes, but, don't you hate those people? We as self-leaders have to be in control of our emotions. We can't be yes, but people. We should follow the, the setting of the scrum saying to say to ourselves, I want to pause, listen, take it in, maybe wait three seconds before I engage with the conversation. As part of my response. It's important that we become streetwise and invest in ourselves. I took my decision for good reason to go down the graduate route. You don't need to. In fact, I believe it's more important that we become streetwise. And I believe in this, this saying that the best university is the university of life. Gandhi said, live, live as if you were to die tomorrow 
learn as you, if you were to live forever. Controlling your finances, just very briefly. Why do you think it's important to control your finances as, uh, on your, in your journey of, of, of self-leadership? It's important that you achieve financial freedom. Because guess what? If it doesn't, and I can talk from personal experience, it clutters your mind and takes your focus off achieving your goals. I bought my first property and I had to sell it after three years for a 10% loss. That's actually the, the block in which I bought. And my investment lesson there was buy without emotion because I said, I'm not going to pay somebody else's bond off. I'm going to own my own. The only, thing, only property I could afford was, was in, a, in a bad neighborhood or be at the best part of in, in the ba bad neighborhood. And I also learned location, location, lo location, like the saying goes. Then I went to the other extreme. I bought in a very expensive um, development and I almost went belly up because my bank, bank, my builder went bankrupt. And what I learned from that was don't financially overextend yourself. Always keep a financial buffer. That's important. The eighth wonder of the world, as Einstein says, is compound interest. You guys can go through the maths afterwards, but I quickly just want to tell you that if you have a one million rand bond, given those assumptions up there, and you decide you're going to work a little bit extra over time, you're going to save a little, and you are able to add 2,000 rand to your monthly repayment. Then you're going to, instead of paying your bond off over 240 months or 20 years, you'll pay it off over 157 months. You will have 73 more months of peace of mind that you've settled your bond. You will pay off 330,000 rand less as a result. Okay, that's a big part to me in terms of achieving financial freedom. Power of negotiating, it's critical negotiate. When I had to renegotiate a bond, I was originally offered, I won't say who the bank is, my, my bank, uh, an interest rate of prime less, 0.25%. Eventually went, got quotes from other banks, and I went back to my bank, and eventually we settled on prime less, 1.75%, which is a massive difference. And over a 20-year bond term, if we decided to pay it off, off over that, that term, it would have saved us 500,000 rand, which is crazy to think about it. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us... Never fear to negotiate. It's important. You are a brand. Lead by the power of your example. And believe it or not, you are a brand like a BMW or a Sony or whichever brand, Coca-Cola or Microsoft you want to mention. And if I have to put those three characters and, and people on the screen, who do you think has got the least valuable brand? And I think it's obvious that even Tarzan as a stronger personal brand than out of Hitler. It's important that we value our personal brands. And part of that is to beat or at least keep our promises. It's a big part of personal brand equity. Tom Peters said, the formula for success is under promise and over deliver. Leading by example, Gandhi said, my life is my message. My question to you and to me is, what is your message? Cherishing relationships are critical. And somebody that, that understood that was Mother Teresa. She dedicated her life to the poor, and that's the way she lived, serving the blind, the aged, and the disabled. And amongst other accolades and achievements, she received a Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. So in our continent and our subcontinent, we have Ubuntu. I am because we are. We've got the ideal opportunity in our day-to-day in our -day living to cherish relationships. Hemingway said, in this case, John Hemingway said, if I have ever seen magic, it has been in Africa. So the reality is also that charity begins at home. And that quote is from Mother Teresa. If you want to change the world, go home and love your family. When I started studying my PhD and through the, last, the five years that I've actually studied it, if it wasn't for the relationships that I had with my wife, with Marley, and with my boys specifically, there's no ways I would have been able to complete it. We need to cherish relationships in our quest to achieve our main personal goals. We need to network more. That's what we're exactly doing right here, right now. And we need each other as part of that network to achieve our goals. Invest in time to reflect Follow effective actions with quiet reflection. You can read up on this guy. 
his name is Randy Pausch, and I've referred to him earlier in terms of quotes. That was the last lecture he did. And see how in the, in the picture at the bottom right, how he's making people laugh. And that was his final reflection on his life because he was diagnosed with terminal cancer a year before that. And he wrote a book, and part of one of the questions that book asked as part of his reflection was, are you spending your time on the right things? It's important that we as self-leaders reflect frequently. Why reflect? Because reflection is about serious thought about one's character and actions. And it's important that we take stock and we decide, am I moving in the right direction in my life? Am I heading in the right direction towards achieving my goals, my dreams, in terms of what I define as what is success about? So what I use to reflect, you can use anything. But if I can take you back to the personal goal scorecard, that's a very good point or good place rather to start to reflect upon and to track your goals and see how you're doing against those goals. And the power of the next time is important. In order to succeed, you must fail, and we all will fail, so that you know what not to do the next time. If you fail, that's fine. But then say, the next time, I won't do it again. With one proviso though, you can't say the next time every time because then you're wheel spinning and you're not getting anywhere in terms of your self-leadership journey and achieving your goals and becoming successful. So we need to embrace that it's never too late. There are two gentlemen on the left, Ray Kroc, on the right, Walt Disney. One thing they had in common, by the way, is that they served together in, this, in, the, in, the, in the same division in the Army, in the Red Cross Ambulance Division. So Ray Kroc, in 1955, April 15th, he started to franchise McDonald's. He was 52 years old. Walt Disney opened Disneyland on a couple of months later, and he was 53 years old. And initially, it wasn't even that successful, Disneyland. It's never too late. It's important to finish strong. I referred to this book earlier. It's never too late to be who you might have been, wrote George Eliot. My grandfather died at 46. Bless his soul. But the only, rec only recollection I have of him, and he died when I was four years old, was that he was an abusive man. He was an alcoholic, and he eventually died of emphysema and lung cancer. So he didn't finish strong. And I want to put it out there to you guys and to myself, the challenge that it's important as self-leaders that we finish strong. Leave the past where the past belongs. We shouldn't have regret. We should forgive, get rid of the guilt, if that's necessary and that's what it takes. And we need to look to the future. The last section I want to take you through quickly is, it's ultimately our choice. If you ask me, and it's much more than that, otherwise it would have been simple, what successful self-leadership is, and if I can summarize in two, two words, I would say it is making the right choice and then having the discipline to following through on those choices. Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, I started with in the beginning, in the first section, and I'm ending with her quote that says, your journey begins with a choice to get up, step out, and live fully. I would end off by telling you about my choice, about this guy that's presenting to you guys today. That picture was taken, I think, when I was four years old, maybe five. But I went to varsity after school, privileged to go to university. I stuffed up for two years totally um, to the point where the university actually said, listen, you have to go now. You're wasting the government's subsidy money. And I left. I went to the army. And I got into the bus in Sinin, which was the closest army station where I could have, could have uh, enlisted. I got onto the bus to drive to the Heidelberg Army Gymnasium. And I had a lot of study debt. I needed to pay back a, a, a bursary. And I went to the army of guys that were in the same school than I was when I wrote matric, and they were two years younger than I was. And on the lawn, a couple of days after we arrived at the army gym, I needed to make a decision. Do I want to stay a troop, as we called it? Do I want to become a corporal, or do I want to become a lieutenant? And no, no disrespect to the other ranks. But I then made a choice. I got to a crossroad in my life where I said, no more. I need to live to my full potential. 
I need to make the right choice, and I marked, I want to become a lieutenant. And that was a defining moment in my self-leadership journey, because from that point onwards, I think I was focused on it more than ever. The point is, I'm not, happened what, I'm not what happened to me. I literally choose what I want to become. So my question to you today is, is your self-leadership journey on track? Mandela said it so nicely, and it's on the left-hand side, you might see it on a box in my lounge as well, where he said, there's no passion to be found in settling for a life that is less than the one you're capable of living. Other question is, what is your legacy? Hold the line. Stay with me. You find yourself alone, riding in green fields with the sun on your face. Do not be troubled. For you are in Elysium, and you're already dead! <laughs> Brothers, what we do in life echoes in eternity. In playing you that video, my wish to you today is that your legacy as successful self-leaders will resonate in eternity. Today I've shared with you these 20 topics very briefly, and I apologize if uh, I went through it very quickly, but it was important to me that I, that I cover all those 20 topics. We have a workshop, SAPEX and Soldati, uh, jointly have a workshop at the end of July, where we will take over a two-day period you guys through the content in much more detail. If you're interested in these topics and the content of these topics, uh, going through my book, which will be the course material, Conquering My Nemesis, Stepping Stones to Successful Self-Leadership. And with that, I'm saying to all of you, a monster, monster big thank you for joining me today. That is my email address. You're more than welcome to email me at any time if you've got any questions.